The DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents The Cavalcade of America, starring Raymond Massey and Beatrice Pearson in The Thinking Heart. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is mine. On next Sunday, our nation will celebrate the birthday of one of its greatest sons. Uh, more words, more eloquent words have been written about Abraham Lincoln than of any other American. And tonight, on the DuPont Cavalcade of America, we want to put together some of those great words. Words written by Carl Sandburg, Walt Whitman, Edgar Lee Masters, Edwin Markham, and other authors who have set down in poetry and in prose portions of the Lincoln story. Now, to tell that story, the DuPont Cavalcade presents the foremost Lincoln interpreter of our time, Raymond Massey, with Beatrice Pearson as Anne Rutledge. who sleep beneath these weeds, beloved in life of Abraham Lincoln, wedded to him, not through union, but through separation. Bloom forever, O Republic, from the dust of my bosom. In the short and simple annals of the poor, it seems there are people who breathe with the earth and take into their lungs and blood some of the dark strength of its mystery. Such a one was Abraham Lincoln, my beloved. He was a learning man. All the years of his life, he sought after new wisdom. Here is a picture of his early seeking. My beloved sits at the feet of his prairie teacher, Mentor Graham of New Salem in Illinois. Now the moods. Every one of us has many moods. You yourself have more than your share of them, Abe. They express the various aspects of your character. So it is with the English language. Now then, name me the five moods. Uh, the indicative, imperative, potential, subjunctive, and infinitive. Mm-hmm. And what do they signify? Well, the indicative mood is the easy one. It indicates a thing, like he loves or he is loved. The imperative mood is used for commanding, like get out of here and be doggone quick about it. <laughs> well, is that the best example you can think of? Well, you can put it in the Bible way, go thou in peace, but it's still imperative. Good, good. Now go on with the potential mood. Well, that signifies possibility, usually of an unpleasant nature, like if I ever get out of debt, I'll probably get right back in again. <laughs> well, Abe, just bear in mind that there are always two professions open if all else fails, school teaching and politics. And I'll choose school teaching. You go into politics and you may get elected, and if you get elected, you got to go to the city. Mm -hmm. What's your objection to cities, Abe? Have you ever seen one? Sure, I've been downriver twice to New Orleans. Do you know every minute of the time I was there, I was scared? Scared? Of what, Abe? Well, it sounds kind of foolish. I was scared of people. <laughs> Did you imagine they'd rob you of all your gold and jewels? No. I was scared they'd kill me. Why? Why should they want to kill you? I don't know. You think a lot about death, don't you? Well, I've had to. Because it's always seemed to be so close to me. Always. As far back as I can remember. When I was no higher than this table, we buried my mother. The milk sick got her, poor creature. I helped Pa make the coffin, whittle the pegs for it with my own jackknife. We buried her in a timber clearing beside my grandmother, old Betsy Sparrow. I used to go there often and look at the place. Used to watch the deer running over her grave with her little feet. I never could kill a deer after that. You're a hopeless mess of inconsistency, Abe Lincoln. Yes, I came here to listen to you and then I do all the talking. I'll get along. No, 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 wait a minute. There's just one more thing I want to show you. It's a poem. Yeah, here it is. You read it, Abe. Yeah. On death, 
Written at the age of 19 by the late John Keats. Can death be sleep when life is but a dream and scenes of bliss pass as a phantom by? The transient pleasures as a vision seem and yet we think the greatest pains to die. How strange it is that man on earth should roam and lead a life of woe, but not forsake his rugged path, nor dare he view alone his future doom, which is but to awake. That sure is good, Mentor. It's fine. Such a man was my beloved, a learning man and a loving man, gentle, kind, and pure in heart. See now an evening in April on the Sangamon. The red bird is speaking its first pink whispers, and the dandelions scatter butter colors in long handfuls over the upland grass. Spring breezes move in the oaks and poplars. The branches of the trees register their forks and angles in flat black shadows over the flat white spread of moon silver on the ground. Lilacs in the dooryard remember to bloom. And my beloved speaks. Anne, will you marry me? Marry you, Abe? I reckon I will love you past any mortal love. Oh, I know I got no right to, no right to hope nor expect anything. Oh, you're not speaking very well for yourself, Mr. Candidate for the Illinois Legislature. No, no, I'm not. Of course, I might win this election, and that might be a point in my favor. I've thought things out clear as I could. Folks seem to like to hear me talk. You can't tell a thing about how they'll vote, though. I wish I knew. And... Yes, Abe? And... Will you marry me? Yes, Abe. I think perhaps I will. August of that summer came. Corn and grass fed by rich rains in May and June stood up stunted of growth for want of more rain. The red berries on the honeysuckles refused to be glad. And I, Anne Rutledge, lay fever-burned. Days passed. Health arrived and was helpless. Moans came from me for the one man of my thoughts. They sent for him. They left the two of us together for a last hour in the log house, with slats of light on his ashen face from an open clabbered door. His eyes burning in a thin shaft of light between the shadows. And, and then, then... Abe. Yes, Doctor? She's gone, Abe. I knew. I knew the moment. Doctor, I can't live with myself any longer. I've got to die and be with her again or I'll go crazy. I can't bear to think of her out there alone. Abe. I'm going with her. I'll find her. I'll find her. Abe, I guess we've got to bear these things like men. I've, I've got to feel it like a man first. Abe. Let go. Let me go. Let me out. Let me out of here. I never left him. Oh, believe me, unbeliever. I was always by his side. Unseen, but not unknown to him. Not quite unknown through all his years. He was a learning man. He was a loving man. He was, most of all, a brave man. In his knowing, in his loving, he could not fail to act. 
In Springfield, the little men, the quibblers, the tremors, the sharp-eyed ones, they told him, hold your tongue, Abe, and take both sides. That's the way to get votes. But he spoke out. He said, A house divided against itself cannot stand. This government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. Such was Abraham Lincoln. He was a man of wisdom, of fortitude, of human heartedness. But he was also a laughing man. He had laughter and youth in his bones. In his head, a rag bag of thoughts he never could expect to sell. As when he said, <laughs> A woman is the only thing I'm afraid of that I know won't hurt me. And when he criticized a bad and childish novel. For those who like this kind of a book, this is the kind of a book they like. And when they came to him and asked him to compose an epitaph for a red Indian beggar, for a dead and friendless tramp in a tattered blanket, he sat down and he wrote, Here lies poor Johnny Congapod. Have mercy on him, gracious God as he would do if he were God and you were Johnny Congapod. Oh, he was a laughing man, was Abe, and the color of the ground was in him, the red earth, the smell and smack of elemental things, the rectitude and patience of the cliff the goodwill of the rain that loves all leaves, and the secrecy of hidden streams. See him now as he stands on the back platform of a train bound for Washington, bearing on his shoulders a gray shawl and all the cares of a country moving toward war. Oh, perhaps this is why I had to die. If I had lived, I'd not have pushed him and prodded him toward this fate. He might never have needed to say goodbye to the prairie, to his neighbors in Springfield. My dear friend, no one not in my situation can appreciate my feelings of sadness at this party. To this place and the kindness of you people, I owe everything. I have lived here a quarter of a century and passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born, and one is buried. I now leave not knowing when or whether ever I may return. I am called upon to assume the presidency at a moment when 11 of our sovereign states have announced their intention to secede from the Union. And threats of war increase in fierceness from day to day. It is a grave duty which I now face. In preparing for it, I have tried to inquire what great principle or ideal it is that has kept this union so long together. And I believe that it was not the mere matter of separation of the colonies from the motherland, but that sentiment in the Declaration of Independence which gave liberty to the people of this country and hope to all the world. This sentiment was the fulfillment of an ancient dream which men have held through all time, a dream that one day they might shake off their chains and find freedom in the brotherhood of life. We gain democracy. And now there is doubt whether it is fit to survive. Perhaps we have come to the dreadful day of awakening, and the dream is ended. And yet, let us believe that this is not true. Let us live to prove that we can cultivate the natural world that is about us, and the intellectual and moral world that is within us so that we may secure an individual, social, and political prosperity whose course shall be forward, and which, while this earth endures, shall not pass away. I commend you to the care of the Almighty, 
as I hope that in your prayers you will remember me. Goodbye, my friends and neighbors. Goodbye, Abe. Goodbye, Abe. Goodbye, Abe. came as it had to come, and I was by his side, unseen, but not quite unknown to him. Look now upon another picture, deep in torment and in war. A man of peace meditates before the bloody carnage of Antietam. General McClellan is now in touch with Lee in front of Sharpsburg and will attack as soon as the fog clears. It's cleared by now. They must be fighting now. What is God's will? They come to me and talk about God's will in righteous deputations and platoons. Day after day, laymen and ministers, they write me prayers from 20 million souls defining me God's will and Horace Greeley's. All of them are sure they know God's will. I am the only man who does not know it. And yet, if it is probable that God should and so very clearly state his will to others on a point of my own duty... It might be thought he would reveal it me directly, more especially as I so earnestly desire to know his will. It is unfathomable. Yet I know this and this only. While I live and breathe, I mean to save the Union if I can, and by whatever means my hands can find under the Constitution. Oh, will of God... I utterly lift up my hands to you and here and now beseech your aid. I have held back when others tugged me on. I have gone on when others pulled me back, striving to read your will, striving to find the justice and expedience of this case, hunting an arrow down the chilly airs until my eyes are blind with the great wind and my heart sick with running after peace. And now, I stand and tremble on the last edge of the last blue cliff. A hound beat out, tail down and belly flattened to the ground. My lungs are breathless and my legs are whipped. Everything in me is whipped except my will. I can't go on. And yet, I must go on. We can fail and fail, but deep against the failure, something wars, something goes forward, something lights a match. Something gets up from Sangamon County ground, armed with a bitter and a blunted axe, and after 20,000 wasted strokes, brings the tall hemlock crashing to the ground. came the captain with a thinking heart. And when the judgment thunders split the house, wrenching the rafters from their ancient rest, he held the ridgepole up and spiked again the rafters of the home. He held his place, held the long purpose like a growing tree, held on through blame and faltered not at praise. With victory near came praise and a great call for vengeance. 
But still, Abraham Lincoln could rise above all violent counsel and say... With malice toward none. With charity for all. With firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in. To bind up the nation's wounds. To care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and for his orphan. To do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And again it is spring. Look now upon this last picture. Here is the stage and all eyes set upon it. There is the box, in shadow, in darkness and neglected in this moment by the laughing crowd, lurking in the shadow's shadow, see an evil man, the one appointed to snuff out a life of wisdom, courage, and love. His name, the name of evil, John Wilkes Booth. His love is hate. His wisdom is cunning. But he's brave enough as such men go. He knows the cardboard play. And he waits to kill at a time he has plotted well, when a laugh will go up. Listen now to the players on stage at Ford's, while Booth and his bullet wait behind the curtains of the box. Mr. You'll see the letter X you are addressing my daughter and in my presence. Augusta, dear, to your room. Yes, ma. The nasty beast. <laughs> Gracious thing, what's everybody going to think? Am I hanging on to you so? They won't think anything about it. Listen, Mary. It's been a long time since I've had a I'm good married. laugh. You're <laughs> Listen. To the manners of good society, and that alone will excuse the impertinence of which you have been guilty. Oh, no, the manners of good society, eh? Well, I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal. You suck dollarizing old man crap. <laughs> <laughs> When lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night, I mourned and yet shall mourn with ever-returning spring. There was a funeral. It took long to pass many given points. Many millions of people saw it. The line of march ran 1,700 miles. Yes, there was a funeral. From the White House in Washington, where it began, they carried his coffin and followed it nights and days for 12 days. Bells tolling, bells sobbing the requiem, the salute guns, cannon rumbling their inarticulate thunder. To Springfield, Illinois, the old hometown, the Sangamon nearby, the new Salem hilltop nearby, for the final rest of the cherished dust. And the night came with a great quiet, and there was rest. The prairie years, the war years, were over. I am Ann Rutledge, who sleep beneath these weeds, beloved in life of Abraham Lincoln, wedded to him, not through union, but through separation. Bloom forever, O Republic, from the dust of my bosom.
You have just heard a special broadcast of the DuPont Cavalcade of America, dedicated to the memory of Abraham Lincoln. The principal voices were Raymond Massey and Beatrice Pearson. The words for this broadcast were taken from Carl Sandberg's The Prairie Years and The War Years, the plays Abe Lincoln in Illinois by Robert E. Sherwood, and Prologue to Glory by E.P. Conkle, the poems Lincoln, Man of the People by Edwin Markham, Anne Rutledge by Edgar Lee Masters, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed by Walt Whitman, and John Brown's Body by Stephen Vincent Benet. The words were chosen and arranged by George H. Faulkner. Bill Hamilton speaking for the DuPont Company. What would you say if DuPont Chemical Science offered you an automobile tire that was much lighter and at the same time much stronger? You'd probably say, I want that. Well, that's exactly what alert progressive tire manufacturers did say when DuPont suggested Cordura High Tenacity Rayon for tire cords. The tires on your car right now may have rayon cords. If so... They give you extra strength and safety because of teamwork between the chemical industry and tire manufacturers. Tire manufacturers tested DuPont Cordura in heavy-duty truck tires on baking hot desert roads. During the war, it proved itself on command cars, trucks, and jeeps. Today, rayon cord tires are widely used by trucks and buses, and leading manufacturers now use DuPont Cordura in tires they make for passenger cars. Why does Cordura help make a tire better? With a natural fiber, the growing conditions, even the climate, affect the strength of the cord as finely used in the tire. A chemically made fiber, on the other hand, is uniform. The tires on your car today, if they have high tenacity rayon cords, are lighter, stronger, and safer. And this same combination of lightness with strength has also earned a welcome for DuPont Cordura Rayon from makers of garden hose, conveyor belts, and V-belts. One of the newest uses is in plastic clotheslines. Cordura High Tenacity Rayon is one of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. Next week... We will present Lee Bowman in a story of a veteran of World War II, his friend, and their hometown. The music for tonight's program was composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Vorey. Our director, John Zoller. The DuPont Cavalcade of America comes to you from the stage of the Belasco Theater in New York and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Next, Baby Snook. Stay tuned for Bob Hope and guest Fred Allen on NBC.